Good evening all. Uh, very pleased to have Gary Dornboss here as our guest speaker. This is certainly, without doubt, the favourite part of being a part of this Bay Club is organising speakers and um, hearing them tell us about their lives with boating. Uh, my family moved to the Gold Coast when I was five and uh, I was at a Cubs uh, meeting, my first Cubs meeting, and uh, we were walked down from the top of a hill, which was near my family home, along the waterfront to the opening of the Land's End Bridge. And going over the Land's End Bridge, turning left, there's this little boat yard, which uh, I drove past one day, and, and ever since then, as a child, I'd ask my parents to call in, at least drive past so I could see what was going on. And if they'd stopped, of course, I was thrilled because I had the opportunity to get out. It was an open yard, it was beside a park, and I could uh, sneak through the yard and see what was going on. I confess that sin, Gary, I'm sorry, but there you are. Um, now, uh, yes, uh, the Dornboss name is a name that uh, was related from the Yacht Club since before I joined the Yacht Club, and uh, certainly uh, uh, sort of well known in the boating circles. I uh, 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 didn't know Gary personally, um, but certainly uh, knew of him and uh, was aware that any boat that could fit under the, the Land's End Bridge, which is nothing like these bridges, it's extremely tight, and Gary can tell us all about the interesting times he's had getting big boats under there. There's the odd bit of paint either side of the pilings as you go through, and I can assure you being very close to the Southport Bar, the tide does run. And uh, I've been going through there um, with the tide up your backside. And uh, it's very interesting when you come around a corner and there's a boat coming towards you because you're totally committed once, you're, uh, once you, you hit those, uh, th those straights with the pilot. So, um, uh, yes, Gary, you're, you're, you're a well-known boating icon on the Gulf Coast and with, with uh, Southport and RQ. And uh, thank you very much for making the time to come here and speak. And uh, without further ado, please come forward. Before I let Gary uh, start, that's uh, Gary with my boat Seaman. Now, this was a story I meant to tell, but I'll tell it now, Gary. Okay. Now, Petrina there in the red was very impressed with, with Gary uh, one day when the boat's in the yard, it's up on blocks, it was actually higher than it is there on the trailer. And I said, Gary, I'm a bit worried about this. So I'll come and have a look at this. So I go down to the back of the boat, climb the stairs, and I get up the bow of the boat and here's Gary up there. And I said, how'd you get up here? He said, I just jumped up. And then my lady said, how the hell did you get up there? She said he put one arm around the bow strip and threw himself up. And that would have been like his arm was there to get up there. I don't know how the hell he did it, but she's been very impressed with you ever since. And she said, you've got the best set of legs on a man she's ever seen. There you are. Thanks, okay. John. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sure Katrina didn't say that at all. <laughs> she did. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, John, I'm not sure whether this is good or bad, but thank you for asking. Um, I guess you'll let me know after the event if, uh, if it was good or bad. Yeah. But uh, my wife Daphne is here, uh, so she came in to listen. She might hear some home truths here. But, uh, so I was born at home, uh, 1946. I come from a family of boat builders. My grandfather uh, had a yard in the uh, south east of Amsterdam and built uh, timber boats, especially if you've been to Holland, you've seen those big timber boats on the lakes with the big bluff bows, you know, the big bows, that sort of stuff. He built all that sort of stuff and they bent timber in those days, not with steam, not with laminating, over a fire. So you had the big fire going and you had the big plank and you just run it backwards and forwards over the, the, the coals and the heat until it became pliable. And they could fit those planks to within millimetres of the curve, put them in with, with trunnels, and that was your boat. So that's, that's where I come from. That's where the history comes. Uh, my dad uh, started his business, uh, his later business, in, uh, in what they call Broker Levine, which is the south of Amsterdam. And the yard is, what's that? 
it's on a, it's on lakes, right? Which is they call Loesdrecht, which is the lakes. There's five lakes, and he built the wall and the shed, the big shed there with the boat building shed. And of course, during the uh, winter, it's all ice, right? That lake freezes over with six inches of ice or, or thicker. And all those boats that are here, he used to have boats here, he used to uh, rent sailing boats, and they'd all end up in those, those sheds during the winter. And the cunning old fellow, when he sheds were out during the summer, he used to make them into holiday flats. So that was the yard where we worked out of. We, uh, our first impression when we came to Australia was, wow, they build big timber boats here, don't they? And we meant big timber boats, anything over 30 feet in holy steel. So you come out here and everything's just huge candlings of timber, like, you know, um, the, uh, in the old metrics, not the metric, but the old imperialists, they're 18 inches by 20 inches of keel, 100 foot long. Never seen in our lives. Everything was steel. So we specialised and we worked in timber. Small stuff, up to 30 feet. A lot of sailing boats, the occasional power boats, but mostly sailing boats. And I can remember sailing with my father when I was about six or seven, because he used to get all these boats coming in over the weekend. He'd hide out and we'd have to sail them around the back and put them back in the marina. So that my, my early memories of, of, um, of Holland. Uh, it was a great, great uh, place to live and uh, we enjoyed it, you know, I enjoyed it immensely until my dad and mum decided that we're going to move to Australia. That's another story, I won't go into that, but we're here and uh, we've enjoyed my last, whatever it is, 60 years here. It's been a fantastic ride. Just as a, a few uh, things that we used to do on the lake here, when I was a kid we used to ice skate and, and also skate to school. It was no, you know, because there's lots of canals and waterways and that sort of stuff, so we could skate to school and, and, and enjoy ourselves, and it was a great time. And most, one of the most exciting things you could do in that lake was ice sail. You know, you got the ice sail with the things on it, with, with the mast and with the skates, and all you could hear was the hiss of these pods over the ice, doing something like 50 or 60 kilometres an hour, Oh, it was charity, sort of, you know, you're like, oh, it's cold, but what exciting it was. It really was good fun. My other uh, sort of, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a timber freak, which I am a timber freak, uh, I can remember my father buying timber for his boat business in African, Sapele and uh, Mahogany. And they would be in a girth of, say, one point two metres, 1.3 metres, and 10 metres long, by the whole log, and then you'd get it cut by a, a big uh, bandsaw, and this, this whole tree would sit in the yard, uh, stacked and drying as you go through. And uh, it was, it was you know, you, you'd have, if you were planking a boat, you could have this huge plank, and no matter what the shape was, you could just cut it out of there. No hand saw, no power tails in those days, fellas and girls. All hand saws. Very hard work. So it was, a, it was an interesting place. It really was. Anyway, 1957, we came to Australia. Got a couple of shots here in the boat. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's the old boat yard from the side. That's my father. And that's me in, in the background. I, never, I, I didn't know anything about that um, until John said he found it somewhere. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Holland. That's, yep. that's still Holland. That's still Holland. That's the boat shed. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the boat shed in Holland with a boat that he just launched. That's my father there. And there's another photograph here of the same boat shed in the middle of winter. So it, it was an uh, interesting place. So 1957, we came out here and started. Uh, I was 11, and uh, we uh, we sort of uh, came out here and we started very small. We we, we uh, built a shed in Bigger Creek where we were, uh, which is the shed that was there now. Yeah, that's the shed there, 
and uh, so we started there. And when we first started, there was because we're not experienced with big boats, we started small, and we made surf boats, millions of staples, and surf skis, that sort of stuff. And my dad actually made um, jump skis for Keith Williams, for the old Keith Williams uh, uh, ski school up in the Narang River. And uh, they were breaking their skis all the time and he started making them out of moulded um, silver ash, out of three layers, and unbreakable. So he did a lot of that uh, until uh, Keith all, all of a sudden decided he wasn't going to pay too much anymore and we decided we weren't going to work for him anymore. But you know, <laughs> it was all sort of... Uh, my mutual agreement. But my father was sort of a, you know, pretty determined and if he needed to be paid, he used to go and visit Keith and say, it's now time to pay. So it was a good arrangement. But, uh, if, anyway, we, uh, as we grow older, as of course you can imagine, when I came out here, there was no English. I, um, I spoke only Dutch. And so I had a lot of, a bit of schooling to do and to catch up with my, uh, my, my language uh, ability. It, it, it was a good time. We had a ball, and, and I did anyway, and uh, it, I'm glad that it, they came out here, because when you really think about it, he was 50, 55 when we came out here, and uh, it was a hell of a challenge for them, and I, I think that you know, they did remarkably well. So uh, anyway, we did all that, and uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, while my dad had sort of, you know, while well, I was still going to school, I built my first boat, and that was a 22 foot sailing boat. There that is. one there. And it, uh, the only reason that you ask, why would you build something like that? Oh, that was pretty, pretty simple. My father brought out a set of sails for one. So I had this new set of sails, and I thought, well, the easiest way to do this is to build a boat. So it took me a couple of years. There were some very frustrating moments building that boat. I can remember it forever. I had a lot of fairing to do and a lot of planing to do, and I just couldn't get it. As a kid, I just couldn't get it. So I said to my father, you got to give me a hand. He said, no, you get used to it. You, know? you make a mistake, fix it, and one of these days you'll win. He's right, I did. So it, eventually I got it going. It was a strip plank out of maple, Queensland maple, and it had a, uh, a gunter rig on it. And we had an absolute ball sailing that. We really did. We had an absolute ball. We, 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 as 15 or 16 year olds, we had, had a few mates by then. And we were on the broad water by ourselves. No boats in the broad water in those days. So it was really good. Anyway, it progressed from there. Um, I started my apprenticeship with my father in 62 and finished in 67. And in those years, um, I built numerous graduates, numerous flying ants, um, lots of stuff for my father. And in the meantime, uh, you know, it was all just working in the yard. Speedboat? Speedboat, yes. I built a speedboat. I built a, uh, a Hedges speedboat in an old house in the yard there. And uh, it turned out to be, see, I, I, I graduated from sail to power because it was much more fun in a, in a power boat than it was in a sailing boat because there were more girls. So, so more girls. We, uh, we had that boat there and we, we, it was a fully uh, uh, mahogany boat with uh, beautifully varnished and all that sort of stuff. And we flogged up to death. We really did. We, we used to ski up in the ski gardens and always on a Sunday. So I did that when I was sort of 17, 18, something like that, when I could drive and tow a car. Um, now, around the yard at that time too, the bigger a creek wasn't very deep. It was very shallow. So in those days, you'd look at the old slip plate here, and you know, I look at the mud and look at this little sort of stuff. Ours was pretty similar, except the creek was only at low tide, was only about a foot and a half deep. So you'd have to drag these boats up on the high tide up towards the slipway. And of course, always, the high tides were at night time during the winter and you had to slip these boats up to here in water and mud, get the boat on the slip properly and pull it out. Lots of fun. Really was lots of fun. But we progressed and we came to, uh, later on, uh, a, a, better, a better system. And especially when they dredged out the, the creek. So that was really good. 
So I'll just go through what I've done and then I'll go back to the boats. Um, when I finished my apprenticeship, uh, I, uh, I decided that I needed to go to Sydney and have a look around. So, uh, and that was really uh, very interesting because when you work at a small yard most of your life and been there, you'd think that the, wor the world must be a bigger and better place and people have bigger and better ideas as somewhere else. So that my idea was I would go and work my way around Australia and work at different boat yards. So I, I got to Sydney and um, I worked at um, Williams Marine in Bayview for a number of, uh, number of months, Pontar Slipway and Davis Marina at North Harbour. In there somewhere I met my wonderful wife Daphne. So the travelling then, just about the idea of travelling any further didn't go much didn't, didn't do any good. So I, I was very happy to sort of work and do that sort of stuff. While I was at Davis Marina, I got an uh, opportunity to do a seagoing shipwright uh, period, not very long, but that was a very interesting, very interesting uh, couple of months. I had to join the uh, Maritime Union and become a seagoing shipwright. The stories are endless on that, on, on that uh, thing. And Ben would know what I'm talking about, and uh, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's a license. It was a license to print money in those days because a 10-day work was actually a 20-day thing because you had 10 days on, 10 days off. And in 1950, uh, 1968, we were getting $525 for a 10-day work period, and that was big money in those days. It really was big money. So yeah, we did. I did that. We got married in 1970, and my father by then uh, has said that he'd finished. The yard was closed, and he was sort of saying, well, if you don't come up here, it'll be gone. Uh, I've, I've had enough. So we got married. We built a house before I started work, and started off at the boat shed at Vigora with skimp, with nothing. And the, the interesting part about that was you had to work because otherwise there's no income. And without the income, there was nothing to eat. So it was, it was interesting. And the first thing that happened to me was, I had this gentleman come in with a magnificent Ferrari car. I remember it forever. This beautiful Ferrari car. And he said, Gary, he said, I've got this boat I'd like you to fix up. I said, okay, this sounds good. You know, this is my man looks cost less money. And when I looked at the boat, I thought, hmm, Nice car, rubbish boat. Anyway, he said, look, he said, I want you to do what you can, fix it up, do whatever you do. And he said, how long would it take? He said, oh, it'll be two or three weeks. He said, okay. So I did that. And Dad was around in those days, sort of looking around and sort of you know, co coming into the yard every now and again and helping. And I said, yeah, he said, I've got this boat to do and it looks like a great job. He said, um, how's he going to pay you? I said, oh, I don't know. They said, well, you know, he's got, a, he's got a, this big car. You know, it's a flash car. He's got plenty of money. Father says, how do you know he owns it? I said, I have no idea. If I was you, I would suggest that when he comes, that you insist he pays you. So, comes along, he comes back in. He said, great job, fantastic. He said, I'll take it. Send the bill to Melbourne. That's where I live. And he said, we'll pay you. And I looked at him and I thought about my father and I said, no, no, I don't think so. I said, you have to, you, you, you're going to have to pay me now. Oh, no, no, you can't do that. Argument, argument after argument. He walked out of the shed. You know what he did? Never came back. <laughs> he left me with the boat. He didn't pay. Never saw him again. And it was the greatest sort of lesson in life that I'd ever had. So, so from, here, from there on in, I was a bit more careful in my thoughts and uh, carried on with the work. We, during our time, um, Dad built some bigger boats. Um, there's a couple there probably on the screen, but if they're not, you know, there's a Seven Seas um, at the middle. He built that in 62. And there's a William and Amy he built in 65. Just to say that Seven Seas in the day was the flashiest boat at the Southport Yacht Club. It was. It was. Without doubt. Yeah, it was. 
and, uh, and also uh, a, a Harvester Marine Patrol boat, which Ron Wright designed in 1967. So we didn't build many big ones. It was, it was a lot of small sailing boats and lots of stuff. So when I started there, I'd made up a, a, my, my uh, decision to, to run the business was that I wasn't too interested in building boats. I was more interested because I felt there was no money in it. It was all sort of, you know, it was the, the glory of building it. But at the end of the day, by the time you got this wrong and that wrong, and the owner said, I want that and that, but then that was all finished, there was, nothing, there was nothing left in it. So I didn't build any new boats for any commercial customers over the 40 years that I was in business. But I did build a number of boats for ourselves. So um, from there, you know, we did a, we did a hell of a lot of, of work in the uh, in the yard. Uh, I built all those jetties you can see in the background there. We, we built all those and the retaining walls, rebuilt all the slipways, uh, replaced all the rails in the water. So we did a hell of a lot of stuff to sort of modernise the place. And in their heyday, we were probably um, six or seven people, sometimes eight, continuous. And, and uh, it, was a, it was a great little business. Uh, one particular uh, repair job we did was a, uh, a boat called Baybird, which you all probably know of. And um, it, uh, it was the biggest, probably the biggest, yeah, it was the biggest boat that we've ever had in the yard. And some clown uh, got on it, lit a fire in it, cut the ropes off the jetty and let it go and close the doors. And it absolutely, it went within, well there's a, it's upside down, but there's, there's a fire. And it, it put itself out because it couldn't get enough oxygen. And it came within probably two mil of the back roof to go through. So we had to rebuild that whole boat from scratch inside. And it was a huge job, I mean, in the middle 80s probably. And, and I remember the price, and it was $52,000 then. It was a huge job. And uh, it, it was a, uh, it's a, it was a very interesting, uh, very interesting project. Excuse it was probably know. the biggest we had. Excuse me, did you say Baybird? Baybird, yep. A sister boat of mine in the, in the creek is also a Baybird. Is that right? That's correct. Seven year old. Right. No. It, it was actually built, I, now I don't know who built it, but I know Trip Connie extended it. Because it was about 10 foot shorter than that. Hey? Yeah. So it was extended and, and uh, the new bow put on because it used to go down the river bow down like that and now it's, uh, it goes like the wind now. It's a, it's a great boat. <coughs> so that, that really, as far as my uh, work is concerned um, in the boat shed, it's pretty boring. Most of it was sort of timber boats, timber boats repairs, and, and we just went on with, with what we did. Yeah, okay, now we go to the fun part. I retired uh, in 80, uh, sorry, in 2008, um, after I had enough, and I told my wife, told Daphne that I've had enough, we're gonna sell. And I think she fell out, nearly fell out of a chair at the time when I said, that's it, I've had enough. Which I think turned out to be a, uh, a pretty good idea because you know we worked pretty hard. I physically worked fairly hard, and you know we did some bad things. I remember grinding, uh, grinding Andy Fowling off with a with a, a, a bandana tied around my nose and the stuff, and I'm red, you know, red everywhere. We used to do that all the time, and, and it's uh, I'm still here. So so I decided that, that, that we decided. <coughs> so when I was about 61, that was it. So we sold it, we sold the yard, sold everything, gave the business to my foreman, and I kept money, and we went, did something I wanted to do. So we built another shed, and I started mucking around, building boats at my time, when I wanted, for the love of playing with wood. And that's, that's me all the way through. Like, I'm very fortunate that I always loved what I did. You know, and we sort of, we, we've had this wonderful relation 
uh, with, with people. Uh, m most of a lot of the customers we came as friends. And it was a, like a really family little business. So and when you could combine that with building with timber and, 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 and enjoying what you did all day, w work wasn't too bad. It was pretty good. Anyway, the first, my first job was that. A little Yuan Pine in an Alfred dinghy, which I, I thought, no, I'm not going to make it out of carpal. That's too easy. So I made it out of two layers Yuan, longitudinally glued one lap over the other with no nails. So they're all laminated. The two planks are laminated together. Every one was glued on with a clamp and no frames inside. There's only a few frames underneath the seats. You can see the frames in the seats there. Everything else is, is um, the, the, the uh, transfer of mahogany. Everything else is you want. And it took me, <laughs> it took me nine months to build it. And, and it was just not because of the time, because of the enjoyment of doing it. So it, it ended up being a, uh, a really lovely job. To make it, I've got it hanging in the, my workshop. And you can see the davits, well they're timber too. And not just pieces of mahogany glued together, there's a core of silver ash in the middle, laminated, and it's encapsulated by silver ash. So it's, uh, it's nice, it's a nice little dinghy. Before then, and while I was still working, I should probably say that, I built that. And you've got this, this thing here, you can have a look later, but a 46 foot. Clem Master's design, a boat called Mahogany. And, and uh, we did that weekends, uh, after finishing at five and doing another two or three hours. And after five years, it came out looking oh, pretty good. Clem uh, got, had a brief to design this thing, and my very good friend Garth Fielding collaborated with him because I thought that was a good idea, the two of them would get together, they'll know what I want. I didn't really give him any big specs. My only spec was that it had to be 42 feet because of where the bridge was. That used to go underneath the bridge, by the way. Where the bridge was, I couldn't have it too big and I couldn't turn it around in the thing, in, in the creek. So when I finished it, when, uh, when, when I finished it and we launched it, no, sorry, sorry. When I when I first saw the plans, it was 46 feet. It wasn't 42 at all. And I had a bit of a complaint and a yelp to to, uh, to both those guys and said, "Nah, said, yeah, what you wanted wouldn't have fit the 42. It had to be 46." Yeah. So so and I said, "Oh, at the end when I built it, it should have been 50, not 40, not 42. So so at the halfway there, it should have been easily more 50." And 42. So it, uh, it was a labour of love. It really was. Um, it, I've st we still own the boat after 25 years. Uh, I've had it to Sydney and back uh, four times, three times. Coming out of Sydney Harbour there now. Did the wooden boat show. And uh, been up the Barrier Reef with it. And it, uh, it was a, uh, it's still a lovely boat. Still a good boat. And, and greatly enjoyed it. Um, before then, I go backwards now. Before then, before then, I had a thing at this thing, which is a Pelham design. Back. It was a Pelham design, 37 feet, laminated, out of, out of hoop. And it was a, a very successful log racing boat. We had a ball in it, really did. And uh, Garth Fenling and I, we used to go up to uh, the Fraser and uh, Sandy Straits and all the time, and Mooloolaba. So it, it did some miles as well. So, so that was while I was still working. That was while I was still working. The dinghy uh, was a uh, when I retired. After that. I had a, a little thing called a gentleman's cruiser. Have you got that? Yeah, that's it. Um, it's a little, a little Pompey design uh, from uh, from Melbourne and Mordialic. 
And I thought that would be something to do, but progress from something small to something bigger. And it's all mahogany inside. It's got uh, seats of mahogany, uh, cap rail, you can see it there. You can see all the, in there it is. It's a wonderful thing. It, uh, it's uh, a little chiller. <laughs> so, uh, and it's got a, uh, it's got a four-cylinder Volvo diesel on it, which is a bit overpowered, probably a 55 horsepower. But uh, it's a it's a great thing. It, it, uh, it, you can put a, probably 10 people in there; it wouldn't make any difference to it. And it, it travels along extremely well. So, a lot of fun. So, th uh, at the moment, I am uh, building another one. And. People ask why. I said because I can. So I'm, uh, I'm building a little. I love Clem Masters as a friend, as a friend, and uh, as a, as a talented boat designer. And uh, I thought it was a little 30 foot Clemmy. Clemmy used to do a, uh, a 30 foot and then a 34. Uh, and the 30 footers were little speed boats. They were they were really they were different to the 34s. And uh, I knew of this boat. Uh, that was a 30, so I talked to the owner and we took some lines off it and then I, I, I lofted it and came up with, no, that's not long enough, I'll make it into a 32. So I've made it into a 32 and I've actually uh, got now probably three quarters of the way through and sort of started from nothing and strip planked it, double biased it, uh, epoxied it everywhere and it's again uh, mahogany, um, cabin sides, mahogany uh, interior with some painted work and that sort of stuff. So it, it's, uh, I have a, probably another six or seven months to go. Uh, I'm going to make it do 20 knots. We're going to have a Yanmar, six on the Yanmar in it, uh, 300 horsepower. And it'll be something different, something to do. And I think Ben Hardy says he'd buy it. So I don't know what, whether that's true or not, Ben. Is that right? <laughs> just because we can <laughs> so yeah so that, that's pretty well my life um, when, I, when I've finished uh, this one I have a dilemma because I have three boats maybe I'll have the little uh, gentleman's cruisers for sale but uh, I have at least two boats and I have a decision to make whether, whether mahogany stays or whether this new one stays and uh, something to look forward to, something to do. Oh yes, and one of my, uh, one of my little restorations was that little white oar. It was me rowing and it used to belong to uh, Rumpy, Rumpy Cavill. He had it for a long time, he actually imported it from, from, uh, from uh, America and then I know Richard and, and the kids sort of uh, gave it help in the, they had it hanging off a set of davits in the back of the house at Runaway Bay. They used to dive on it, sink it, kill it, trample it. And Cap said to me one day, he said, Gary, he said, I've got something for you. He said, what's that? He said, well, you can have the boat. He said, the best part of the boat is the, the oars. And he said, you can do what you like with it. So I thought, oh, okay. So I rebuilt it, put new gunnels around it, uh, made it look sort of a bit special. And it's now sitting in the shed, and it rows like stink. What a beautiful thing to row! It really rows really well. So that's another uh, another little job I had. So John, I, I don't think I need to go too much further. Um, I'm, I'm sort of you've done well, pretty yeah. well, pretty well covered. If anybody got any questions, I'm happy to ask any answer any questions. The secret, she's supposed to whisper in my ear. Okay. But, but Gary, can you tell us in the meantime while she's this trip? You know, going through that bridge, mate, how many disasters did you have, if any? Yeah, I had two. Hold on, I'll let her whisper first. Yeah, yeah, there's some up uh, on that on that screen here somewhere. Was that, was that where that was? Yeah. 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 Thanks, Marina. Well done. Yeah, so I had two disasters with that. Um, with that bridge, both were my own boats. 
because I was a bit more game than probably uh, with my own boat. But I had it, I pretty well had it worked out to that much because the bridge was built with a camber on it. So if you go from the outside in, it was seven inches higher on the outside than on the inside. But I only hit it twice. It didn't do a lot of damage, but only in my own boats. Nobody else, no, no customer's boat got, got hurt. So, uh, uh, bravo. Bra well, pretty well. But I'm not sure about that bravo, but uh, you know. And it, we, was, it was going out with the tide. I always found it exceedingly uh, stressful. Yes. And, yes. and uh, yes. Gary, but Gary had done sea wind up for me. With my little 23 foot motor sail that was my grandfather's, and um, I'd thrown out the old steering box, gave it the deep six in the broadwater one day when I was coming back to the marina, till I steered at home, and I was given a Willie's steering box. Gave Gary all the bits and pieces to put it all back together. Gary puts it in the water. I go to reverse out of the marina. I can't drive the bloody thing. It was left hand drive. So everything went back to front. <laughs> so you want to go to starboard, you've got to go this way. Port, you've got to go that way. Well, I've got to tell you, going through that bridge with a run out tight where well, you need a bit of speed on, but Trina will tell you it was very, uh, it required an awful lot of concentration. And the boat comes towards you and it became even more stressful. But Gary rectified that and improved the, the look of the. Uh, of the very, a very rudimentary mechanism we had previously. It was interesting. It, it was interesting. Um, going to a couple of stories of my father, actually, um, he had some very interesting stuff, like pretty down direct and, and, and sort of stuff. He said uh, about the, the the credit and that sort of stuff, you know. But in, in the end, he was normally pretty right in, in all the things he said. He sort of, you know, he, he knew what was going on. And, and uh, you know, it, it was, uh, as far as, giving me the insight on how to run a business um, I thought he did really really well and I know I'm, I'm, I'm boasting a little bit here but I think my my debts or, or the debt to people who owed this money after 40 years I think it was five hundred dollars in the 40 years that we worked uh, we were not owed a cent and I think that goes credit to, to what what we did um, because I, I always felt and I always told my employees that you're paid to do a job you're not paid to cut corners. If you do cut corners and you make a mistake, the customer will have a go at me, and you can rest assured I'll have a go at you. You know, so so it was always to the fact that do the job, do the job properly, and and you, know, you end up everybody being happy, and, and that was sort of the mantle that we worked under. So, uh, and uh, you know, I was sorry to see it go, but I was happy for the memories afterwards. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Thank you.